Right. Um, yeah. So, uh, thank you everybody for, um, for, for your patience, uh, while we resolve the technical issues. Um, my name's Phil Clark and I'm a professor of international politics at SOAS and also a uh, co-director of the center on conflict rights and justice, which is the center that's, uh, hosting, um, today's webinar. Um, it, it's a real privilege, uh, to have Azu Ansalu, uh, with us. Um, Azu, I know, will be uh, very familiar to many of you already, so she, she hardly needs an introduction, but nevertheless, I will uh, introduce her. Um, Azu's Professor of Law, Societies and, and Justice at the University of Washington uh, in Seattle, uh, where she's also the director of the Middle East Center. Uh, she's a, a legal anthropologist um, uh, with a, a PhD in cultural anthropology uh, from Stanford. Um, but amongst many other things, she's also a former asylum and refugee attorney. Um, her work really covers many areas, but uh, particularly looks at women's rights and human rights uh, in, in different cultural contexts. Uh, she's obviously done a huge amount of ethnographic work um, in Iran specifically. Um, her first monograph, which came out in 2009, uh, was entitled The Politics of Women's Rights in Iran. And her second, um, <laughs> and her second monograph, uh, which she's going to speak to us about today, uh, is called "Forgiveness Work: Mercy, Law, and Victims' Rights uh, in Iran." Um, I can hold up my personal copy. Um, it's a, a really fantastic book. Um, I, I, I can't recommend it to you highly enough. Um, elegantly written, uh, persuasively argued, uh, amazing uh, empirical material, but also I think the theoretical contributions even beyond the Iran case are, are really profound. So um, Azu, it's a, a real pleasure for the Centre and for SOAS uh, to have you. Very much looking forward to, to hearing you speak about your book. Um, you're extremely welcome. Um, over to you. And just in terms of the format, Azu is going to speak for about 40 minutes or so, and then there'll be lots of time for question and answer afterwards. So, um, Azu, thanks very much. Oh, and thank you so much for this invitation. It's really delightful to be here. And just so you know, the light really is the way you see it here. The, the, our sun is coming up a bit late this morning, but it's still coming. Um, thank you again for this invitation. Um, I'll try to move along so that maybe because we started a little bit late, it won't take so much time. But um, yes, yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about my research um, for this book. And um, it, it, one of the things I did a lot of was sit in on trials in criminal court, murder trials in particular. And um, there was one trial that really caught my eye that I want to talk a little bit with you about today and then talk about some of the implications of that um, trial. So, um, in August 2016, I was sitting in um, in a criminal trial in Tehran's Provincial Criminal Court, and that's the court for the entire province, not just the city, um, where a wife and two daughters accepted the charges of having murdered their husband and father by poisoning, then strangling him, and finally dismembering the body with an electric saw before stuffing its bits into black plastic bags for disposal. Um, and they were caught just as they were stuffing the pieces in the bag. Now, at the end of the nearly three hour hearing, the chief judge brought the trial to a close by having the plaintiffs, that is the victim's brother and two sisters, and the defendants, that is their nieces and sister-in-law, sign their testimonies. The judge then looked at the parties on both sides of the room and said, I think you need to talk. Now, as he proposed to clear the courtroom of spectators, he announced, in this case, there is room for forgiveness. And so with the party's agreement, the chief judge, along with his two associate judges, stepped out of the role of fact finder to that of mediator holding a reconciliation meeting between the parties in that very space. The judge aimed to avoid the imposition of the harshest sentence the plaintiffs could demand, resas or retribution, which in this case meant death. In the final admonition, the judge noted, look, I'm not taking any side in this hearing. 
and then turned to the family of the victims and said, your right to retribution is preserved by law, but I want you to consider this. Every murder has its reason. Now to those in the courtroom who had sat in on the entire trial, this was a reference to the notarized letters that the defendants had submitted alleging years of violent behavior consisting of beatings and verbal and sexual abuse. And the judge continued, I recommend you read the letters your nieces have written. Now the problem with the letters was that they were allegations unsupported by any other evidence besides the defendant's own assertions. During questioning, one of the judges had noted that they read the letters in the file, but give us something that can prove your claims, he added. Did you ever tell anyone about the abuse? Over the alleged decades of abuse, the women in the family had never reported the violence, had never filed a police report, had never even confided in a family member. Given this society's grave concerns with propriety and face saving, it surprised no one when the defendants responded with an unequivocal no. One of the defendants, the older daughter, testified, our mother told us that what he did to us should never leave this house. Such testimony may have been useful in making a claim that the killing was in self-defense, but without corroborating evidence, there was little the judges could do to avoid a finding of intentional murder, the sentence for which was retribution, but a sentence that only the victim's nearest relatives could exercise. So the judges convened this reconciliation meeting between the parties. A tete-a-tete -tete provided the family of the victim a forum in which they could air their anger and hurt. It also allowed a non-official, non-recorded, and thus face-saving venue in which the defendants could speak of the violence and abuse not as justification for murder, but as factors contributing to the defendant's state of mind, what we might call mitigating factors. So while such practices have been occurring in Iran on an ad hoc basis for years, well, generations really, Iran's recently revised code of criminal procedure confirms the judge's role as mediators and even strongly encourages them to try to achieve reconciliation. Now, in my talk today, I want to explore the legal right of forbearance in Iran's criminal justice system. And I know that this forbearance is not something we often hear about with regard to Iranian criminal sanctioning. So I wanted to understand how the codification of forbearance operated in that legal system in which the family of the victim possesses a private right of retribution. And by private right, I mean that literally, it's a property right that, that, that is actually inherited. Um, and so they can exercise it or they can forego it. Now this element of the system that in homicide and numerous other crimes, not just homicide, retribution is literally the right of the victims, is little known and understudied. Much, criminal uh, much research on criminal justice, not just in Iran or the Middle East, but just generally, suggests that people want revenge after the death of a loved one. And scholars have suggested that is exactly why we must not have a justice system that gives so much power to victims. So I thought this was an interesting case study to look at the implications of a system that provides this form of relief and indeed is a system in which the preservation of victims' rights is at its very core. So in the larger project, the book that Phil so kindly held up, I explore what I see are as a set of, um, as an example of an extreme victim-centered approach to criminal justice. Um, and I do this through an ethnographic study that focuses on who forgives and why, when the law gives them the right to pursue retribution. My research began in 2007 on this project, 
And during annual research trips to Iran, I conducted participant observation with families of victims, lawyers, judges, prosecutors. I sat in on murder trials and interviewed and followed the activities of social workers and other actors, such as actual actors, <laughs> athletes, members of the olama, the religious scholarly community, and other prominent individuals who work with families of victims to move them towards foregoing their right of retribution. In this talk, I want to focus on how the state, through its judicial officials, works both to maintain the victim's right to retribution and at the same time to encourage them to forego it. Although forbearance can and does take place at any stage in the criminal proceeding, after the indictment, during the trial, and after sentencing, it actually very rarely takes place in the trial stage. The most uh, forbearances take place while the case is pending in the implementations unit. That is, during the long period between the sentence being issued and its implementation, when the perpetrator is waiting. Now, just a few words about the criminal process. After it, um, th their, their system, you know, I come from the United States and we have a British common law system um, with some civil codes. Now, theirs is much more akin to a, a French common law, uh, sorry, a French civil law system, their procedures. So after a judge in the criminal court issues the sentence of qisas, retribution, therefore validating a finding of intentional murder, the case returns to the prosecutor's office and the file is then sent to this implementations unit. Once all the appeals are exhausted and the head of Iran's judiciary issues what is called an istizan or a permission to carry out the sentence, then the case is ready for execution quite literally. And it is in that period that it that judges, all of these forgiveness workers, actually aim to stretch out the period in which the, the uh, sentence is actually carried out. Um, Iran's system of criminal justice is notoriously harsh. We know that. Iran has the world's highest rate of capital punishment per capita. Um, and most executions are for drug convictions. In the past, it was between two-thirds and three-fourths. And I say in the past because in 2018, Iran's parliament passed legislation that removed the death pen penalty for most drug-related crimes and thus has overall has reduced its overall executions significantly. Um, but the issue that I examine in my book is death penalty for murder, for intentional murder cases. Um, which are guided by shad, the shad, which are guided by Islamic principles, not um, other kinds of laws, ta, what are called ta'azir. Um, now, through this case, I wanted to understand in socio-legal terms what the phrase that the judge used, room for forgiveness, means. How does it come about? What even motivates judges in the post-trial mediation to engage in this? And so in the talk, I want to just say a little bit about the uh, criminal justice system in Iran, then situate forgiveness work in this case, and finally conclude with some thoughts about what it means to have a victim-centered criminal justice system. So as many of you may be aware, after the 1979 revolution, Iran's leaders rewrote the national laws to conform with Islamic principles as they saw them and major revisions to the criminal laws in 2012 and 2015 actually finalized those codes for the first time. Um, but they did confirm particularly severe retributive sanctioning, which we do hear about quite often. At the same time, they strengthened and enhanced the possibility of the plaintiff, uh, plaintiff's forbearance, which they derive from the Muslim mandate to be merciful and compassionate. And there are specific provisions, um, uh, uh, chapters, verses in the Quran that are the basis for this. And if you're interested, it, one is chapter five, for, uh, verse 45, and the other is chapter two, verse 178. And so the codes of criminal procedure so th there's the substantive law that is based on these um, religious obligations to be merciful and compassionate. The codes of criminal procedure also create 
This is new, what I call an imperfect duty on the part of government officials to work to bring about reconciliation whenever possible. So that means the penal codes, the substantive law, recognize forbearance as a right. And the code of criminal procedure call on government agents tasked with carrying out that substantive law to do so with an eye towards achieving the greater goal of reconciliation. And there are numerous articles in the penal code and the code of criminal procedure that lay this out, that make it clear. Now this moral and legal obligation notwithstanding, there are virtually no guidelines regulating how officials and others should go about attaining forbearance. Nor do the codes specify any specific group or agency to do this work. Hence, my question about the judge's motivations to engage in forgiveness work. This tension between the compulsion to seek reconciliation and yet no guidance on how to do so has proved to be a productive one. And this is actually how I start thinking about all of this forgiveness work that I see going on. Over the years, numerous groups and individuals, political and non-governmental, have intervened in murder cases and others that I, I don't talk about in the book, um, but they have intervened in these cases to which they are not parties with the aim of bringing about reconciliation between victims and perpetrators. And the absence of meaningful guidelines alongside a manifest moral and legal duty to forgive, I argue, has generated an informal cottage industry of advocacy that engenders numerous avenues for negotiating forgiveness and forging reconciliation. And I use the term cottage industry intentionally because I want to highlight the informality of the system as well as its ritual forms that engage and actually, you know, fill up this lack of otherwise other guidelines, right? The, the, the use of ritual forms engage what is now a flourishing complex of activity or industry around forgiveness, especially when it comes to capital punishment. So in thinking about co the cottage industry, I draw on Sally Falk Moore's notion of semi-autonomous social fields. Moore proposed that a field be studied through its semi-autonomy, the idea that it can generate rules and customs and symbols internally, but also that it is vulnerable to forces outside as well. So this semi-autonomous social field has rule-making capacities and the means to induce compliance, but it is also set in a larger matrix of who can affect it. So Moore developed this approach to study distinct groups within pre-existing social arrangements. And she, she observed that in these fields, legislation is handed down by centralized governments and it encroaches on the social fields that already have their own rules and customs. But I'm suggesting something slightly different. In this case, it's the legislation itself, which in some important ways forges this social field, the forgiveness industry, if you will. But the important contribution of Moore's approach here is that she says studies in the nature of the autonomy and the quality of their self-regulation might yield valuable information about the processes of social life in complex societies. And this is, I think, what drew me to this, this uh, work of more because we are able to learn something about how in an absence of guidelines, the, these um, self-regulation could happen. And we're looking at a complex society, unlike what she was doing. So by employing this approach, I, I want to better understand the processes that create this industry for forgiveness work, as I call it, and also condition the granting of forgiveness by the families of victim, by the uh, victims. 
And then of course, there are the judges who are duty bound by law and scriptures. And so now I wanna go back to the meeting, the reconciliation meeting. With the room cleared, there remained the parties, the judges, there are three of them, the prison guards, the psychologist from the juvenile correction center because one of the perpetrators was under the age of 18, two social workers who were present at the request of the defendants, several journalists from local newspapers, and myself, the researcher. So that's with the room cleared. Now, to assure the propriety of what was about to take place, the judge, the chief judge, reiterated that the hearing, the trial phase, had come to an end. Everything is over, he said. This is the start of the reconciliation and meeting uh, and settlement meeting. For those of you who speak Persian. Now, as though taking those words as a cue to step away from the role of the impartial trier of fact to sage advisor, one of the younger associate judges stepped off the judge's raised platform. He walked over to the parties holding out his arms and he reiterated, there is room for forgiveness in this case. He had read the detailed letters of abuse and was apparently swayed by the pleas on the part of the perpetrators. The letters, however, as I said, carried no legal weight, even if they were telling and sympathetic to the perpetrators. On the side of the victim's family, the uncle or the brother of the victim first cried out, I'm not ready to have them executed, but right now I am exploding with grief. He said, so many times I told them, if something is wrong, come and tell me. But they never did. The last time I said, if you don't like my brother, then divorce. All these people are getting divorced. Not wanting to veer into retrying the facts, the chief judge, now mediator, spoke. We don't want to hear this now. And then added, our duty in all of our cases is to arrive at reconciliation. I want to ask this of you, that you try to come to a solution between you. Then one of the aunts answered, they don't pray. As a way of undercutting the young women's character and credibility. Now, looking directly at her two nieces, who were slowly walking towards her, the aunt said, if my brother was so bad, why didn't you tell me? The young women were now shepherded by the social workers towards their aunts and uncle. The social workers and the prison guards and the others started to admonish the young women, plead, go, go, ask for forgiveness. As they approached, the aunts began castigating the young women and the guards stood closely by to protect them from any physical harm. The journalist and the researcher hung back, taking in the situation. The girls then fell to their knees at the feet of their aunts and begged for their lives through their tears. They repeatedly cried, forgive us, please, please forgive us. The aunts looked away, folded their arms at their chests and instead looked up at the crowd gathered around them. Why should we forgive? Why should we be merciful when they were not? By now, everyone, including the prison guards and the journalists, were advocating to spare the lives of the women. And different voices spoke with varying degrees of rapidity. They did wrong, but you do right. No, I won't forgive. By killing them, you won't receive God's mercy. Now, the chief judge was still in, on his perch, tidying his desk, packing his briefcase, and he spoke loudly over the others, with your mercy, you will be helping them become better people. But they said those things about our brother. No, I won't agree. Then the associate judge did something interesting. He leaned towards the aunts while standing beside the defendants and said, you saw what we did. We didn't accept the things they said about him. They are your brother's family though, his children. Do this act of kindness on your brother's behalf. Do it for him, for his memory, and it will bring you peace. The associate judge was attuned to the effect 
that the women's testimony, the defendant's testimony, had had on the family of the victim. And as a consequence, on their chances of, give, of foregoing retribution, that testimony, although providing context and motive in the defendant's legal case, elicited only anger and grief in the siblings. In such contexts, families of victims often spoke to me about a double injury. First, they had to contend with the physical loss of their loved one. And now, on top of that, they had to endure the desecration of his reputation. Here, the legal process of truth seeking clashes with the culture of face saving. This particular tension arose frequently as a delicate conundrum in the context of forgiveness work. How could the family of the victim forego retribution or even forgive the perpetrator after the hurtful claims that the defendant had made, even if as a legal defense? In such contexts, families feared that others would see their, their forbearance as a validation of the defendant's claims. On the other hand, carrying out retribution felt, some felt, would prove and punish what the family saw as lies and provide a relief to the surviving kin and a certain redemption of the deceased's reputation. Most hearings that deal with questions around morality and chastity, such as rape, are actually held in camera without the public in attendance. And even if only one of the charges has to do with sexual conduct, the judges will clear the courtroom for testimony on that particular issue. In this case, the testimony was more difficult to play down because it was presented as part of a defense. Um, the judges further admonished the defendants during the testimony um, and said, you know, um, we, we've read the file. This was a less than subtle reference to the fact that they were aware of the defendant's sexual abuse allegations, but did not want them to be announced in the courtroom. But my brother didn't do those things. He didn't, one of the aunts said. The associate judge turned to the older defendant now, the older sister, and said, say you made a mistake. And she repeated through sobs, I made a mistake. And then her younger sister too repeated, I made a mistake. And their mother did the same. Now the judge apparently saw an opening and called for the clerk to bring him the court's official forms. He looked at the aunts and said, look, they admitted they were wrong to have done that. To say those things about your brother. Now have mercy, you'll see, you'll find peace. And the judge began to dictate the contents. The there's a standard turn of phrase. While the clerk wrote it out in longhand. Then the judge, the same judge, called over a journalist and told him to go and do an interview with the uh, victim's family to clarify for the record that their brother was not an immoral person to be published in the next day's edition. The journalist stepped forward, knelt in front of the uncle, and began writing in his notepad. At that time, the associate judge went to work on the forbearance affidavit, and the social workers stepped in. One, clar one clarified that what appeared to be a point of confusion for the aunts and said, oh, no, no, they won't be freed from uh, if you forego retribution. They'll be sent to prison for 10 years. A prison guard added, even after being released, they will, they will have parole. And another added, and they won't be furloughed either. And a social worker then chimed in, and you can also receive compensation. Now, while the statement of forbearance had legal effect and the agreement between the parties would be approved by the court, none of the assurances by the social workers and prison guards carried the same weight. Um, the uncle expressed uncertainty about taking compensation and the associate judge came back and said, you don't have to keep it. You can take compensation or you can give it to charity. And then one of the social workers added, but let them pay something for what they did. Finally, upon the approval, the case would be remanded back 
to the same court for sentencing. Now, not for a murder crime, but for the public offense of disturbing peace and security. And the maximum sentence for that was indeed 10 years minus time served. There was still no guarantee that the defendants would actually receive all of that. Um, nevertheless, the time had come to sign the affidavit and the judge pushed it in front of the, the aunts. And wh what it says is that each member of the family who has a private and individual right to, for, uh, forego, uh, to retribution says they will forego it without doubt or reservation, a legal term of art that would not invalidate uh, the agreements, uh, extrajudicial agreements between the parties that include things like compensation. Um, the associate judge extended the document to the aunts and said, do it for God, sign. The first aunt signed, then the judge handed it over to the other one. And I'm asking this of you, sign. The chief judge called over. The judges were aware that their words carry tremendous weight. Besides having judicial authority, the stature of judges, especially the respected ones, carries with it moral rectitude as well. Meanwhile, the young women, the defendants, are on their knees, wailing now out of a cautious relief. Finally, everyone had signed and the associate judge victoriously proclaimed, with your benevolence and chivalry, Javon Madi, you have foregone your right of retribution. The mood in the room quickly shifted into a celebratory one, and people congratulated one another, sent greetings to the prophet, and finally, they gathered themselves, stood up, and returned. They had to go back to prison until the processing of the case. Now, as we filed out, some, many people were congratulating the judges for how well they presided over the hearing and handled the reconciliation meeting. The judges seemed unaffected. I met the chief judge in the elevator and I noted how rare it was to hold such a meeting right after the, the trial on the merits. And I asked, how did you know? What made you hold the meeting right then and there? He just looked at me and said, 43 years of experience. So a few days later, the associate judge um, was a bit more forthcoming. And he said to me, I knew the, defend, uh, the, the plaintiffs by their hesitation were open to foregoing their right of retribution. And he said, when I asked them what they want to do, they replied, the uncle especially, he, this is the judge talking, said, I, he, the uncle had said he didn't want retribution. And the judge added, I knew these were not the type of people to carry out Ressas. Since I knew they would eventually forgive, I thought we could just finish it right then and there. When I continued impressed, what were the motivations for holding for, for being so engaged in the reconciliation. After all, he's a judge. He replied, this is both in our religion and in our laws. And this phrase, in our religion and our laws, is one I often heard in the process of carrying out this research. Um, the distinction frequently made to me um, by state officials raised for me an important question between the two. What does it mean in an Islamic Republic that bureaucrats, government functionaries, um, make this distinction between religion and law? In Iran's Islamic Republic, it is government representatives who have the final and definitive word on state laws based on their readings of religious principles. So the distinction between religion and law is important because in the final analysis, Law is a question of state sovereignty. Ultimately, the state's monopoly on law and its interpretation overtake the heated debates and nuance found in Islamic jurisprudential thought. Thus, in this context, 
the fact that the judge points out his religious duty as significant, um, it, I, I'm sorry, the, the fact that the judge points out his religious duty has significance because such an obligation suggests a concern with ethics derived towards, uh, derived from a duty to God, which is not sublimated by or reduced to the worldly concerns of the state's monopoly over legitimate violence. In other words, the law. It remains, however, that what is being adjudicated in criminal court is not law and not, uh, sorry, it remains that what is being adjudicated in criminal court is law and not shar, Islamic principles. Rather, the court's process, processes reveal how law conceals by its very codification, the ethical attributes, the room for nuance, the space for debate, implicit in Sharia, Islamic principles, while at the same time securing the state's sovereign authority over the people. While the scholarly debates in the seminaries of Qom and Najaf highlight the changing, fluid, and evolving nature of the Sharia, their codification as law ossifies the principles and disassociates them from their ethical underpinnings the very basis of their fluidity. It is us, uh, sorry, it is thus left up to the individual judges, the better trained among them to be sure, to apply a skilled ethical discretion, taking in the ethical foundations of the shad into their application of the criminal codes. The ossification and inflexibility of law is apparent in the codification of the homicide crimes for which there are three categories and only three categories, I might add, intentional murder, unintentional murder, and quasi-intentional or accidental murder. As one defense lawyer told me, this is a big problem in our law. Judges are forced to give the ruling for intentional murder when it is not always so. Few exceptions exist in the law, but the revisions to the law, these more recent revisions I mentioned, permit some argument on the part of lawyers that there were circumstances to mitigate a sentence of intentional murder. So what I'm trying to say is that the legal code constrains the law. And for the first three and a half decades of the Islamic Republic of Iran, the emphasis was on a reinstitution of the foundational aim of preserving the right of the victim's family. The new revisions to the laws, however, offer increased flexibility, discretion, and even some alternative sanctioning. While the judges cannot forego the qissas, the retribution, private right of Lesos, and the law constrains them in their sentencing with the, in this respect, particularly due to the overly broad definition of an intentional murder. Their discretion, however, is broadened in their duty to seek reconciliation. And, you know, I grant you, discretion can be problematic, but discretion is broadened in the context of forbearance and the duty to seek reconciliation and to bring the parties to a settlement can offer possibilities for forbearance at any and all stages in the sanctioning process, from the original arrest and investigation to the indictment, the judgment, and later even the implementation. So I just have like a few pages left, but I'm going to just try to quickly say what, what I think this means. Um, if we look more at the idea of codifying mercy, um, we want to situate legal forbearance in the context of this changing and standardizing legal process, which creates this problematic, if you will, the duty to reach reconciliation while preserving the victim's rights to retribution. Um, that this idea, this system um, recognizes that loss or injury to a loved one 
creates a private right of equal justice. And there are two important points to take from this. One is that it's the family of the victim who is the victim here. Sorry, that makes no sense. Okay. The family of the victim decides how to dispose of that right. It's their right. Second, the state sees its role as preserving that right. So it's actually a very classic liberal move that the sovereign harnesses the authority to preserve the peace by mediating over disputes. So the judici judiciary's role thus is one of harnessing and regulating that space for settling accounts so people don't go out and take revenge into their own hands. So the state claims the monopoly on legitimate violence by requiring that any payback take place within its processes. And by giving private citizens the right to ask the state to exercise that violence, the state does implicate them in its own logic for settling disputes, regardless of whether they exercise the right or forego it. Now this process bears some resemblance to state formation in common law and civil law countries as well, but with notable distinctions. Um, so in his introduction to English legal history, um, J.H. Baker contends Anglo-Saxon codes did not codify existing tribal laws, let alone make new law. Instead, he says, the new codes to, were directed at readers who could be presumed to know the customs already and offered fixed rules to govern situations which must previously have rested on discretion. So codes limited discretion, but sought to repair loss or injury based on the pre-existing customs of the time. They just didn't spell them out. Nevertheless, the codification of tort law, not just in Iran, but even in Western societies, are still bound up with pre-legal customs that sought to extract damages incurred for the staining of honor. Now, what legal anthropologist Robert Redfield described this as simple societies moved from employing retaliative sanctions to developing what he called proto-legal institutions. And Redfield, and actually in an essay almost two decades later by Foucault, suggested that the formalization of law emerged through the development of systems of compensation or forms of socially approved retaliation in the development of what might be called a rudimentary law of torts. And the overall goal was to rein in unlimited revenge between groups. So it is this proto-tort law that Redfield and others argue is the beginnings of a modern justice system. And the reason for that is because on, at the other side, we have something um, that looks like criminal law. So the creation of two sets of laws, tort law and criminal law, is for many scholars, the beginning of a modern justice system. The, the harm that the law punished in criminal law was that what was done to societies, not just to the families. And, you know, we can remember Maine's uh, very important assertion that we move from status to contract, right? Um, but in addition to that, this shift was also recognizing that codes secularize and individuated these earlier practices and ultimately privileged the harm done to society over those of the family. So in many jurisdictions, uh, in the US at, at least, not maybe where you are, um, it's the state that has the right to capital punishment, not the family of the victim. In Iran, it's the reverse, right? Um, so by giving the victim's family the paramount decision over life and death, 
the system is still more focused on family relationships and perceived kinship structures, and thus, to some extent, on status over contract. One of the effects of this is that the emphasis on honor is much more explicit than in contemporary Western context, which I have a separate article where I argue that we're also very concerned with honor, but since it's not written into our codes, it's much more implicit. The Iranian system's emphasis on the injury to the victim's family not only has the effect of accentuating the social importance of the family's honor, but it also serves to entrench the perceptions of gender roles that emerge from them. And that's why if you read the book, you'll see women are very intimately involved in forgiveness work and are many times designated by their families to be the decider for what happens in these cases. Um, but what's interesting about this that I want to point out is that even while the system kind of raises or privileges the importance of honor in this kin-based system, we also see it privilege and raise the importance of reconciliation and settlement processes, which we don't see as much in the, at least in the United States, in these jurisdictions. So one of the residual effects of pre-codified practices on this Iranian legal system is the greater entrenchment with gender roles, explicit concern with honor, but also a greater interest in seeking reconciliation. So what I wanted to say here, and this is where I'll end, is that in as much as the process perpetuates gendered and status-based relationships, the new laws also limit them in important ways. The new provisions in the penal codes also draw from other practices and customs that aim to restore the broken peace. So I'm sorry if I went a little bit long and I thank you for your attention. Fantastic. Thanks, Azu. Uh, such a, a rich presentation that there's so much there to, to unpack and discuss. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to throw it open to the group now uh, for anyone who, who has any questions or comments or, or clarifications. Um, I can see Nishan already. I mean, maybe if um, before people speak, if you could just introduce yourself so that uh, Azu knows exactly who she's speaking to. Um, but yeah, I, I see a hand up and, and Nishan, um, over to you. And maybe tell Azu where you are as well, because I know a lot of you are, are scattered around the world at the moment. So having a sense of the geography of this group might, uh, might also help. So yeah, Nishan. Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, so I'm in India right now at the moment. So, uh, so my question is that uh, when we speak about this retributory form of justice, which is served out with, with by Iran, so uh, you spoke about the fact that how the victims are getting their right to decide whether uh, who, whether there should be capital punishment or not. So, isn't that kind of creating an uh, isn't that kind of uh, creating more conflict within the victim and perpetrator because if if a certain uh, if a certain victim chooses to use the power of capital punishment but the other one chooses to forgive isn't there that creating a division in society and a certain inequality between uh, two different murder victims great do you want to take that azu yeah i i, I just want to make sure i understood the question so uh, when you said doesn't that create inequality between different murder victims but you were also yes. talking about within families or not? Yes, yes, exactly. So like uh, if within families, a, if a certain family member is, uh, is given capital punishment and another one is spared. So that is, yeah. there is clearly a uh, division there because this, when the state is deciding there, they're deciding on the basis of uh, mitigating circumstances and aggravating circumstances. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, so I, I I, I understand your question, but I actually want to open it uh, in two ways. One, in one murder case, there are multiple family members and every single family member must forego their right of retribution in order to spare the perpetrator. And that's already 
a huge debate within families. And then what you're talking about is the unequal application of law in the context of giving the families this right. And it's, it's so interesting that you ask this question. So a lot of people in um, sort of my legal scholarly friends in the United States said the same thing to me. And I actually asked several judges and I asked, um, I was in Rom, which is the jurisprudential capital in, in Iran and much of the Shi'i world. And I said, what, what do you say about this? And the judge said, well, you know, in the US at least, so I can talk about the US, that's what I know. He said, well, every state has different laws. How is that not unequal application? So criminal law in general is not uh, federalized or standardized. So we have 50 states and every state has their own. We have states that don't have the death penalty. We have states that do have the death penalty. Um, we have states that have a moratorium on the death penalty. And he said, he, so that's that, what, what that judge said about application. Then another judge literally the, the next morning came to me with a printout of an execution, and this is in my book, I can't remember, but it was a, a, it, the state of, um, I don't remember, Alabama or Georgia or something, they had, or Virginia, anyway, they had executed a man who, in, in the US, this was in 2015, I think, who was deemed to have had an IQ below um, 70 or something, and he said, you know, this is what, what, you, what you know, where is this? And, you know, and they, they referenced the, the um, high rate of uh, car incarceration by black and brown people in the US. Like I was surprised how well they knew what was going on. And I should just tell you, I've been following the case in this case in the US where um, the federal government has now used the death penalty eight times um, and has not, it had not been used in the last 15 years. And in the last um, year, I think they've used it eight times. And now between now and the inauguration of the new president, they're trying to execute three people. And um, so it's, so I, I agree with you. Like that was my first instinct too. What about the application of the law? And the judge's response was that, what, why do you assume that the state applies the law evenly, but families of victims can't. And in fact, they argue that they're the victims. They're the closest to the injury. So what's more fair than that? That, you know, that's their way of, of, of responding to that. But thank you for your question. Yeah, thank, thank you. Because I mean, like, the, this is actually the, you know, like, they've stuck to the traditional norms, which were used like the eye for an eye whenever somebody was killed in the uh, in the medieval times like you the victim used to decide and they've used that an an analogy in the, it's even in today's date so that is why it's kind of interesting in that way but uh, thanks a lot for your answer uh, i would just clarify one thing we like we ha we do have a retributive system of law we, d we don't give the right of retribution to the family of the victim, but our system in the United States is still a retributive system. Great, thanks, Nishan. Um, another question or, or comment, who, who, would like to, who would like to intervene? So, so I, I'm gonna abuse my role as chair then, Azu. I, I have so many questions about this, but one of them, I guess, is about the the idea of forgiveness in this entire uh, process, and and what you think it leads to. So, you know, th this is an, an unusual approach to forgiveness. Um, in some senses, you, you know, it's firstly it's um, incredibly public, um, you know, which might go against some people's default expectation of what forgiveness is that that it's often very personal um done out of the public gaze in order to secure its sincerity and and, and its meaning for the parties so that the public element seems complex um you, you've got a high degree of mediation um not just by parties who are directly involved in the harm um but extraneous parties like the judge in in this kind of situation um and much of this seems to carry some notion of obligation. I mean, you use the word duty quite a lot. Um, and, and I wonder, 
you know, fr from your vantage point as a um, as an anthropologist studying this, what do you think of the this type of forgiveness and how meaningful it is? And and do you think that it stands a chance of leading to the kind of reconciliation that the system is, you know, purportedly supposed to achieve? Um, given all the pressure that we see exerted on the nature of the forgiveness process, I, I just I just wonder if if you can. Uh, talk about the impact of it um, and, and, and what do you think it ultimately leads to for the parties that you observed? Sure, I will do that. Thank you for that wonderful question. It's really a, a thought provoking question. Um, I, I, I want to say two things at the outset. First is in the book, and maybe we don't have time in the talk to do this, but I really make a distinction between the at the legal act of forbearance, which actually has its own term, it's gozash, you forego your right of retribution, it's codified, it's in there, and forgiveness, what in Persian is bachshish, and I think those two are really different. Now, I kind of might have used the terms interchangeably because my interlocutors use those terms interchangeably, and they very much see the legal act as a legal act. Um, and I always ask that question, that follow-up question to my interlocutors who did forego their right of retribution and said, um, but did you forgive? And you, it, it's, it's a, like I write about it in the book and it's very hard for me to, stay, to say, um, oh yes, they all forgave or they didn't, or you know, some did some, it, it's, 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 it is, as you say, it's not public, it's very personal. Mm -hmm. And some of the stories that I heard were really um, like mind blowing. So the, when I asked that question of a woman whose son was murdered by her daughter-in-law and then after many years, she forewent um, retribution, she said that um, her son came to her in a dream and he told her that it would be all right to forego retribution. And that highlights two things. One, a lot of time the victim's family knows that they're just, a, in a sense, they've inherited the actual victim's right of retribution, right? And so they have to do right by that person. And I have so many cases where people had a dream, where their loved one came to them. And I said to her, this mother, I said, did you forgive Sogand, your daughter-in-law? And she said, with all of my heart. But a lot of that came from the release of forbearance. So forbearance releases her in order to forgive. Uh, and I saw this in many cases. And the other thing I would say that's really interesting is most of the, okay, most, maybe, maybe 50%, like right there, right in the middle, of the forgiveness workers that I knew and worked with were already people who had done this, where they were victims of a crime and they forgave their, the perpetrator. What I write about in the book that's really interesting from a broader sociological standpoint, if you will, is that many of the people I met who were forgiveness workers were already touched by crime and they, it was very difficult and they forgave. Then, they started doing this forgiveness work, but they said to me, we only work on behalf of, you know, people, kids, uh, youth under the age of 18. We only work on that because we really don't believe they should be executed. This is before Iran changed their laws. It's now much harder to execute youth. Um, and then a few years later, that same person said to me, Oh, no, well, you know, there are actually a lot of cases. It's much more complicated. So we work on behalf of anybody who we think has, you know, mitigating circumstances. And then a few years later, I'm totally against the death penalty. There, it's just completely wrong. And I'm going to fight. So I saw the transformation over this period of 13 years of people shifting in their own, in their own hearts, in their, in who they were. And, and many people talk about this, like, you know, I don't want to get corny here, but like a very um, cathartic experience of forgiveness led to being a more forgiving overall. 
Um, and just one last comment is the part about whether it's public. The way I think I presented this makes it look like it's public, but after um, there, there have been a lot of public campaigns, but after the, ex if the very, very sad um, execution of Rehana Jabbari in October 2014, most um, of this kind of advocacy is now very, very private very, very behind the scenes. And in my research, I would meet people, you know, because I, I have an American accent or whatever, they would say to me, are you a journalist? We don't want this to go virtual. We don't, Matt Josie, we don't want this to go public. So, so they came to see that the broader public advocacy actually in many cases hurts the family of the victim even more. And so that's become kind of standard policy like the the forgiveness work is becoming more and more standardized too and that's one of the ways they've standardized it right it's so interesting yeah Ashen. yeah thank you hi Arzu. how are you welcome to 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 SOAS. i would love to chat but it's not the it's not the right forum well, thanks for a wonderful talk i had one ear at a board meeting phil knows what i'm talking about so you may have answered this um but i was wondering about the role of emotions um in in the process of of forgiveness it seems to be such a charged atmosphere and you i really envy you that you were right in there uh, you know to feel how how these how these people were, were processing these these you know enormous uh, emotions so has there been any research in that in that regard and if not how did it feel to you um, when you were there did you feel that you know there was this this ability on an individual level to rationalize this this process or was it was it more about emo about emotions um yeah it's fascinating i would just would love to to know what you what you thought about this oh that's a wonderful question thank you so much um i write a lot about the emotion and um there's I i'm so glad you said that like I, I worked really hard in this presentation to try to make you see how emotional it was and what a charged atmosphere it was. And you see, this is a, a very maybe subtle strategy on the part of these judicial officials. What they want is to use the courtroom, the char chube space here of the state to allow the anger, the grief, the emotion to be expelled. And um, even I think while Halak in one of his books has also written about this, that this space is intended. The, the, so that's why there's this demarcation. There's legal reasons for the demarcation between the trial where you don't want to show too much emotion, but there's also the Jalise Solusages, the reconciliation meeting, where that's where they want you. They want people to scream and cry. And you know, the prison cards came to because they were afraid the ants were gonna hit the girls, but you know, no physical violence, but seriously scream and cry and beg and plead and say what you want. They try to open this space to do that. Um, I, I had a meeting with the um, head of the uh, juvenile correction center and it was very interesting because i asked him if you know he had any experiences with this and he has a phd in psychology himself and he would hold these reconciliation meetings in his office and he told me this story it took place over seven years of trying to get this family to forego retribution for a, a youth under 18 who had killed someone in their family. And then he told me the story in the steps, you know, he brought them to the office and he brought both, he would summon both parties and a lot of them do this. And as he was telling me the story of how like, they, the first meeting, like they fought, like it got even worse. And they, the last thing they said was, now I'm definitely going to execute. I wasn't sure before, but now I'm definitely. And I said to him, didn't you feel bad? Weren't you worried? And he said, no, this is the process, the expiation that needs to happen. And we try to create a place for it. Um, and, and their idea is that if they do that, we'll get closer to forbearance, but at the same time, it will prevent the likelihood of violence, you know, taking the violence into their own hands and going out into the communities. 
I hope I answered your question. Thank you so much. How oh, fascinating! It, it really, I could I could listen to that the whole day. It's it's really <laughs> amazing. I mean, the the type of field research that you've done for this book, um, it's it's unique. Uh, really, really, um, yeah, fascinating stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions, comments. There are so many angles on this book. Um, who have we got there? Aoife, yeah, sorry. Aoife. I, I can't figure out how to raise my hand, so I'm just doing <laughs> it. Right. I don't know either. I've been <laughs> I've had six weeks to work out how to use Blackboard, and, and Zoom is beyond me, so you're, you're ahead of me there, Aoife. Yeah, it looks like I'm co-host as well, so I don't know how that happened either, but I'll just roll with it. You can do what you like. It's, it's, like, it's like the the legal forums Azu's talking about. There's a lot of lot of popular power in the process. Yeah, over to you. Um, I just had two clarifying questions. Um, just as you were talking there about um, about that it took seven years. Um, in one case and then it was immediate after the other one um, I was just wondering like it made me think are they just doing it for as long as the people agree and like agree to forgo their right um, especially since the judges seemed quite pushy in the first example so I was just wondering about that um, and then also I had a, another question what was it um, Oh yeah, um, just because um, you were touching on earlier about um, how our system is still retributive, even if it's not necessarily capital punishment. I just wanted to clarify that they're forgoing their right to capital punishment, but they don't have any say in whether they go to prison or not, right? So that mm -hmm. I would still consider punishment and retributive, but they don't get a say there. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, both of your questions are excellent. Thank you so much. So um, I have a whole chapter on time because I, I, it was the last chapter I wrote and I felt, I realized like time is actually a character. Like I have a chapter on the lawyers, the social workers, and I'm like, I need a, ca a chapter on time because time plays such a huge role here. And, um, you know, I asked the, the judge in the implementations unit, the one who's job it is to like set up the execution and carry it out. I said, well, how do you decide when like all avenues for forbearance have been exhausted? And um, he said that he can tell, you know, kind of like the judge in the story, like they can tell, they just can tell, but um, they do let the deliberations go on when if other social workers or just people come to them and say, look, we're working on it. It's, ha it's sorry, I should it's happening, we're working on it. Um, so yes, for as, as long as the judges feel like there's something going on that, um, like, in fact, when I was in the office of the judge of the implementations unit, um, the, his staff person who's in charge of scheduling executions, how morbid that sounds, came into his office and he went down this list and he's like, this one, he's like, yes, this one. No, they're still deliberating, I believe. They're close to a settlement. This one, uh, I've called them to my office. So, you know, he's like kind of figuring out how, how to do it. So um, time plays, but you have to remember also the family of the victims hate that. Like this thing is just sitting on them and all they do is think about this day and night and all kinds of random people are constantly getting in touch with them to forgive. And um, So while I was in this judge's office one time, the a, a gentleman walked in, he was sweating, he was angry, he had driven through the night from like six hours away and he was like, when are you going to do this? We're sick of it. We've been waiting five, six, I can't remember, years for this to happen. What are you guys doing? Just kill, kill him already. So you see, the, they're also balancing, like, preserving this right, because if we don't, these people might take it out on their own hands. And as a state, the state is, that's their most important concern. Um, as to your second question, um, yes, I didn't say this clearly in the talk. So the in this system the murder case the private case has press ha, has priority and that one is tried first if there's a forgiveness forbearance then you have the 
um, the, the state sanctioning, which is not for murder. It's for disturbing the peace. And the maximum sentence for disturbing the peace is 10 years. And um, in the US, for example, it's the opposite. So the state prosecutes the trial and the state has the death penalty. If they don't you know, reach the, that decision, the family of the victim can then sue for what we call unlawful death lawsuits. And they get you know, a monetary injury some. So it's actually the, the order is different, but there are the two processes both exist. I don't know, are we out of time? <laughs> I don't want to, I feel bad. Like we started late. People might have things oh, to do. Oh, it's fine. I, I, I was going to see if, the, if there were further comments or questions. Um, I, I, have, I have so many. I, I, I was looking down my list. I didn't know where to start. I... Okay. Can I just say one thing about the last question too? It is, it's really interesting. So in the new criminal code, if the family hasn't made a decision, so this brings your two questions together. If the family hasn't made a decision within 10 years, the, that, the perpetrator has reached the maximum state sanction for prison. So now they can actually petition, put up some kind of security and get out of prison. And the family still hasn't made a decision. And I said, well, what happens if the family, like on the 11th year says, oh, we changed our minds. Like technically they can do that. Like that's really bizarre to me, but that's in the new law. Because sometimes families just, they don't want to make a decision. They don't want to forgive a, the killer of their family, but they also don't want to be responsible for executing someone. So they just do nothing. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> One of the things I was interested in, Azu, both in your presentation and also in the book, is, I mean, the, I mean, Arshan's right. Your, your empirical material is really breathtaking. I think the the ethnographic depth, the, the examples, that, but also the long engagement that you've got with a lot of your interlocutors. You can tell there's a real sense of trust there. You follow up on these cases. You kind of watch them all the way through. And I, I, I wondered about where your findings go beyond the Iranian context. So, because you, you have a lot to say in the book about the theoretical uh, relevance of, of your findings. And look, and I, I ask this because I guess in the politics department at SOAS, one of the things that we're interested in is how, how concepts travel across time and space um, and, and, and how understandings of concepts like justice and forgiveness and mercy and forbearance in one particular context might still have a resonance beyond that context. Even the concept of law, I think, is heavily contested in, in the work that you're doing. So I, I mean, and you do talk about this in the book, so I know you've got an answer for it. So um, I just wonder if you could say something about that, you know, where you see the, the relevance, the significance of your work, even beyond the very particular context in which you did all of that amazing ethnographic fieldwork. What's the answer in the book? No, just kidding. I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> this Wait, is the pop quiz, yeah. Um, <laughs> is it a good answer? Um, so this is a really interesting question. I'm coming from, I'm in a country that has not had diplomatic relations with Iran for 40 years. I'm in a country that has unilaterally sanctioned Iranians, Iranian people collectively. Um, and so it's, it's an odd question from my standpoint that people would think that they have something to learn from the Iranian system, if you will. But, um, you know, I'm th surprised sometimes by people like some of my own students, and one of them is here, Bori, hi. Um, okay. When they ask me questions that are so, um, like, sincere and earnest and really interested in the, the kind of thing that you're talking about. What can we learn from this? And what I can tell you is, um, you know, from our days in Fetzer Institute, where we worked on forgiveness, um, there are a lot of cases in the US where there is no um, possibility of forbearance in the criminal trials and murder trials in the United States, there have been cases, actually many that Phil and I have come across because of that, that other project we were on, where families of victims want to forgive the perpetrator, but there's no room 
for forgiveness, if you will. There's no space in which that has any kind of impact or effect. And that was actually one of the ways I, I was able to do this project. Like I would tell judges, they were like, are you a journalist? You know, that you just want to expose our human, our, our murder capital stuff. I said, people, like everybody already knows that. Everybody already knows that you guys execute people. <laughs> what people don't know is that there's forgiveness in this system because we don't have it in the United States. And when I said that, that was like all hands on. That's when I got access. And there have been a lot of cases where people want to forego retribution in the United States and it doesn't have any legal meaning. Now, to be more precise with regard to your question, um, I have a colleague in my department who works with lifers who are on death row um, and they, uh, I'm sorry, they're not, they're either on, they're, they're lifers, they're on, uh, they're on, they're not on death row, they're in prison for life. And a lot of them wish, he says, they could just be executed because it's like a double death sentence. One death sentence is being sentenced to life in prison and the other one is that you die in prison. So it's a double death sentence. And a lot of times he told me that people, not, not the lifers necessarily, but sometimes come up for a parole hearing to be paroled after spending 20, 30 years in prison. And you know what they say? The family of a victim comes to this meeting and says, you, you didn't even apologize. You didn't even say you were sorry. And what's really interesting that I didn't know is that in many of these cases, the perpetrator is prohibited from contacting the family of the victim. There's actually what is called a no contact order. So then the family of the victim comes to oppose the parole because the person never apologized. So I think there are incremental things that can happen. Like if we recognize how important these meetings are, even the ones where there's yelling and screaming because of the expiation necessary. Like I wanna yell and scream at the person who did me wrong. I don't wanna come home and it's not enough to like come home and yell and scream at somebody else. Do you see what I'm saying? So yes, I think these avenues exist. And um, uh, just quickly, there was a very interesting case in Florida where a young man, you know, because people have guns in America, killed his girlfriend. They were having a fight. And the family of the victim who were about to welcome this young man as their son-in-law, um, they wanted to forgive him. They're very Christian, very religious, and religion plays an important part. And they held, they, ha they had a mediator come in, not a religious mediator, but a, a come in and they had a circle, a forgiveness circle, and they wanted Colin to tell them exactly what happened. And the, the mother of the victim was sitting right next to Colin, and she said, like, what happened? And he told her, I shot her. And, and she said in her book, that she was hoping he would say it was an accident. And what's more, like then, like initially she said she thought maybe he should have like five years in prison, but when she realized that, she thought, no, he should be in prison for a longer period. In addition to that, the prosecutor was a part of the circle. And as soon as Cullen said that, he got up and left because he just got evidence that he could use against Cullen. So, it, the way that that worked it wasn't so great. I, I think Colin ended up getting 25 years in prison. So there's so much more I think that we could talk yeah. about, but I, I think we have um, re reached the end of our time. Um, th the only thing I think that's left to say is that, um, uh, yeah, Nisha. I had a question. Yeah, I had a question. Yeah, if you could keep it short, because. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so uh, my question is basically, uh, you spoke about how religion has to play a, a big part in the execution because uh, I'm not really conversant with the Sharia law, the Islamic principles, whether uh, whether uh, death penalty is accept, how much it is accepted, and uh, whether the, under the Islamic fundamental principles, whether uh, killing of another person is uh, is right or wrong because. As, as you are aware in the US, like uh, the, there are pro-life Republicans who are against the death penalty and there are certain pro-life Republicans who are for the death penalty. So, uh, so that's what I was wondering. So how, is, how does it play out in the case of uh, the Islamic law? Uh, that's actually a very interesting question and, and it's, it pre 
it's exactly what creates this quandary on the part of the perpetrators. Uh, killing someone is 100% uh, prohibited in Islam. However, if you are the victim or you know the family of the victim of someone who's been Islam does, according to the people who've interpreted it this way, give you this right of retribution and at the same time encourages forgiveness, forbearance of that retribution. Now, just one caveat, as I said in my talk, these concepts in the Sharia are debated in Rome, in Islamic seminaries. What I'm telling you is the state law, and there's a very important distinction to be made here, because when I go to Rome and Najaf, you have, you see papers, you see scholarly journals, there are dozens of scholarly journals in Najaf, on just this topic. And one very famous, um, uh, highest ranking scholar, um, uh, Vera, uh, Vera Fakhti, no, sorry, uh, you know what I'm talking about. The, the highest ranking scholar, his, his name is um, Bayat Zanjani. He said to me that, you know, I went to see him and he said, well, like, what do you know? prove that you know something. And I talked to him about the provisions that give the right of retribution. And then he quoted an Arabic saying that's in the, the Quran. I don't speak Arabic. Persians don't speak Arabic generally, but the Quran is written in Arabic. And he said, what do you think that phrase means? And I said, it's the right of retribution. He said, no, it means you follow the story. Resas what people say is retribution comes from shares a root with this story. What, what, what it means to follow the story means you need to have a procedure, criminal procedure. There needs to be a process. It doesn't mean you have to kill the perpetrator. So even on that point, there's tremendous debate. When I've talked about this to my Western Islamic law scholars, they told me that that guy in Rome doesn't know what he's talking about. I actually believe the guy in Rome. So, <laughs> even, but what, what I want to say is even there, there's debate. So, thank you, thank you so much. Fantastic, Azu. I mean, as, as you can see, the, the conversation could, could continue for a very long time, but unfortunately, I, I'm going to have to draw this to a close. Um, look, once again, people, um, get a copy of. <laughs> Forgiveness works. It's you, you, your host isn't doing his job if if he's not helping you at least try to shift a few copies of the book, Azu. But look, it's a fantastic <laughs> book, um, and, and everyone can tell that from the just the, the the quality of the presentation, the richness of the material, the the clarity of the thinking, Azu. This has uh, really been a fantastic discussion. We're we're really grateful for you giving up time, um, especially very early uh, in the day um, on on a Tuesday um, there in Seattle. But uh, th thanks once again. And, and uh, we, we'll undoubtedly have you back at SOAS uh, probably to talk about your next book, which I'm sure you're working on already. So uh, oh, th thanks again. It's been a, a real privilege. Thank you for your attention. I mean, I know this is really hard and I am really grateful to the invitation and all of you for participating, staying late, starting late, all that stuff. And hopefully for the next book, we can have you in person in London. That, uh, that, that would be ideal. <laughs> I have to write another book to get invited? Okay. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> How about an article? <laughs> it's, a tough, it's a tough gig here. It's a tough gig. <laughs> thanks again, Azu. Really fantastic. And thanks, everybody, for, for coming. Thank you, Azu, John. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Take it easy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.